dear colleagues, we start our our sec uh, our session, and we have um, we have three presentations. Uh, the first pre presentation um, is um, verification of smart contract code generated by applied artificial in intelligence. Presented presenter Olga Kononova, please. So, good afternoon to all the conference participants. My name is Olga Konova, and today I'm going to present our uh, research paper, Verification of Smart Contracts Code Generated by Applying of Artificial Intelligence. Uh, so, the relevance of the study is um, due to the growing popularity of blockchain technology and increase in the number of blockchain projects that use smart contracts to automate various operations. The emergence of uh, large language models, LLMs, capable of text recognition and generation make it possible uh, to generate smart contracts code. However, the results of this code generation are not always perfect. These smart contracts uh, created in this way may contain errors and vulnerabilities, but the presence of vulnerabilities with a uh, contract code can lead to successful attacks by malicious entities and um, subsequent financial losses. So, the issue of verifying the code of smart contracts generated by tools using LMs is quite relevant and important for ensuring the security of decentralized applications. Uh, we propose an approach to the, to the verification of smart contracts, particularly those created using artificial intelligence, through the insertion modeling system. The IMS is based on the concept of interaction of agents in the environment, Agents interact with each other according to the rules that are formalized in the form of um, uh, actions and the algebra of behavior. The main idea is to create a formal model of a smart contract by translating uh, the smart contract code into ML's algebraic specifications. And the next step involves verifying the proper functioning of this model along with the formalization of a textual case as a goal state and the proof of its achievement. We will also show a graphical representation of the result in trace in the form of chart and MSC diagram, as well as effect of the reach in the goal state on the trace. So, in this paper, we describe the complete process of creation and verification of smart contracts. It consists of the following stages. Uh, the first one is collection and specification of requirements for smart contracts. The source of requirement when creating smart contract can be by paper, autonomic papers of blockchain project, um, business rule of the project, and other internal documents. Uh, the next step, we use the development requirements to generate smart contract code using an AI-based tool. The next step is translation of the generated code into algebraic specifications for the insertion modeling system. Uh, the next one is creation and formalization of test cases that cover the requirements for smart contract. In order to further verify the correctness of the work of the created formal model, we create acceptance criteria, which will be later formalized in the syntax of the goal state in the IMS. And the final step is to run our model and check whether it reaches the goal state and whether there are any deadlocks in our program. So, in our, this research, we consider the smart contract responsible for controlling the process of managing decentralized platform investor tokens that they purchase during the private sale. It's a cryptocurrency phase that occurs during the private sale. And during uh, this process, token lockup occurs. In this case, the smart contract allows us to automate the process of acquiring and blocking tokens and their subsequent unlocking in accordance with the conditions defined during the private sale. So uh, the, this way, the use of smart contracts provide automatic execution logic without the need for third-party intervention. So in this diagram on the slide, we present main actions of the users within the defined process. Investor has the opportunity to buy tokens during the private sale, 
uh, put their tokens on staking and farming, and tokens bought by the investor during the private sale are blocked for a certain period. So to generate the code of smart contracts using an artificial intelligence, it's necessary to provide clear, comprehensive, and understandable requirements. Because the completeness and accuracy of requirements definition affects the result of the smart contract code generation. In this study, we are solely focused on the process of unlocking tokens for investors by smart contracts. Uh, to generate code um, as language for smart contracts, we have uh, chosen Solidity language. So to generate code in this language using an ai based generator we created requirements that are presented on the slide as requirement one and requirement two perspective uh, so we decompose the requirements for the unlocking process we divide initial unlocking and monthly unlocking and then this next these requirements will be passed to the code generator as an instruction for creation a smart contract code so, as I have said, based on the requirements, uh, uh, this Solidity code was generated. Using the JIT code framework, these tools uh, make it possible to generate code for a large number of programming languages, including Solidity, based on a simple text query entered by the user. So, the code fragment of the smart contract controls the process of unlocking tokens on investor. It's on the slide. And the code of the developed smart contract later will be analyzed using the algebraic approach implemented with an insertion modeling system. Uh, so next, we need to translate the smart contract code into algebraic specifications. Program translation is implemented by analyzing the source code of smart contract written in the Solidity programming language. Uh, this analysis is performed using the NTLR grammar, which defines the synt syntactic structure of the code. So after analyzing the source code, a parsing tree is formed, which illustrates the structure of the program according to the rules of the partial grammar. And the translator performs the translation of Solidity source code into IMS source code following the rules of the IMS semantics. So in the insertion modeling system, uh, it is based on the concept of interaction of agent and requirements. Agents interact with each other according to the rules that are formalized in the form of actions and the algebra of behavior. So, as a result of translation of the smart contract code, we receive an algebraic model. And based on our smart contract code, we have got uh, two following agents, a smart contract and investor, the recipient of the smart contract. And uh, on the slide, we can see how these agents are presented in IMS system and attributes of these agents within the system. Um, in insertion modeling system, is action is presented as hard triple. It contains process and precondition and postcondition of this process. Uh, so precondition and postcondition are presented by the logic expression of the basic language and define conditions on the set of states of the system. So each action defines properties of the system and can be understood as a statement of temporal logic. If the precondition is true, so then the protocol process starts. And after its successful completion, the post condition must be true. So the agent can change its state. If the precondition is true, the state will be changed correspondingly uh, to the post condition. So in the form of algebraic specifications, actions are presented by the list of equalities. On the left is the name and list of parameters uh, whose values are substituted from the behavior. And on the slide, we can see the action of token locking in algebraic form. The uh, locking tokens action has the following parameters, the agent, for which this action is applied to the number of locking tokens for the agent and the number when the recipient connects and the smart contract blocks his tokens in the amount of token amount. Uh, so on this slide, we can see a main smart contract code. It's a part of behavior that describes the process of blocking, as well as the subsequent process of unlocking tokens for the corresponding connected recipient of the smart contract. Uh, in this part, we can see sequential composition of locking and unlocking behaviors. Token locking is presented by the following behavior. It's green on the slide uh, code fragment, where locking tokens is a corresponding action in the IMS syntax that is applied in the corresponding month. And token unlocking occurs according to the predetermined unlocking schedule following the line or unlocking. 
First, an initial quantity of tokens is unlocked, and then the monthly unlocking process occurs according to the predefined schedule. And this is defined as a sequential composition of actions. Uh, the developed algebraic specifications uh, can be used in the IMS systems, which allows, based on input data, obtain a graphical interpretation of changes in the values of specified attributes. And on this picture, we, present, uh, we can see that the trajectory of unlocking tokens for the corresponding, uh, for the corresponding recipients. So, after the investor purchases tokens, the smart contracts automatically lock the specified number of tokens for a certain period in accordance with uh, um, the terms of the private sale. And on the picture, we can see that investor purchased 1,000 tokens and the second purchased 2,000 tokens. These tokens left locked in the contract account uh, until unlocking begins. After the 10 months from the start of the project, in accordance with requirement one from the previous part, an initial unlocking of 30% of the locked token occurs. First, first during the period from 11th to 10th months, in accordance with requirement two, liner unlocking of the remaining token occurs. And we can see that uh, in months 20, the number of locked tokens for investor is zero. So modeling result meets our expectations. Um, we have created acceptance criteria that will help us ensure that the model works correctly to confirm confirm the correct operation of the smart contract uh, functions, we need to formalize the described acceptance criteria in the syntax of the goal state in the IMS system. Uh, the programmer manually creates a test case using the assertion model language. It checks whether the smart contract code reaches the goal state defined in the requirement specifications. So it's an important step to confirm that the program performs as expected in functionality and security. And on this slide, we can see the test case one presented in the form of go uh, goal state in IMS system. After running the model, IMS generated two traces. The first one is full trace successful termination, and the second one describes the path in which the goal state is achievable. On this picture, the fragment of the trace in the form of, of uh, MSC diagram is shown. Message sequence charts show the process of interaction between system components and investors during the purchase of tokens. Uh, presented MSC diagram shows the process of initial unlocking of investor tokens. So after the arrival of the 10th month, the smart contract automatically unlock uh, 300 tokens, which is equal to 30% of the number of tokens bought by investor one during the private sale and transfer them to the address of investor two. So our requirements are completed. And conclusions. Uh, in this study, we presented the process of smart contract uh, generation using artificial intelligence and um, smart contract verification with the insertion modeling system. As a described approach includes the following stages, the gathering and specifications of requirements for smart contract, a uh, code generation based on developed requirements using uh, the generative AI tool, translation of the generated code into the algebraic specifications of the IMS system by analyzing the source code of smart contract, uh, creation and formalization of acceptance criteria for smart contract and um, checking the correctness of the obtained formal model. So in the course of this work, we check the model reaches the specified goal state, which indicates the implemented functionality of smart contract meets the uh, specified requirements acceptance criteria. Thank you for your attention. Questions, please. Um. Why I'm asking about it? Because the main part and the most interesting part of your presentation was about code analysis, not about code generation. What's the difference between code generated and created manually? Yes. Uh -huh, okay. No. Um, because it's in your title. 
Um, for now, no, the main goal of this um, study was to verify this code, but the difference is for this period of time, this code isn't uh, of good quality. It uh, uh, may contain various vulnerabilities uh, like overflow or uh, some uh, other one. And uh, it doesn't always operate as it is expected. So maybe it's a most difference. But all this mistake can be made by software engineer too. Yes, I agree. Uh, so we try to verify the smart contracts to find these vulnerabilities. And in this case, it's no difference between this code, code generated by model and code generated by, by software engineer. Maybe it depends on software engineer and its qualification, his qualification. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Question? Any question? Thank you. I have a question. <laughs> uh, do, uh, does your approach um, support uh, verification of uh, interchange between agent of the blockchain system. Inter 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 in interaction between uh, between uh, a blockchain system. Yes, uh, the use of uh, this system, insertion modeling system, it's uh, based on uh, analysis of interaction of agents. In our case, um, environment is blockchain and agents are smart contract and. Uh, uh, investor and we explore how they uh, can interact and change their state during uh, some behavior, some scenario. We can give some uh, values parameters and explore how they can change during some behavior process in our modeling. Okay, what model of uh, of uh, time? Uh, uh, what model of time uh, you uh, you used? Uh, we said uh, in our requirements there were some uh, months, some period of time in months. So uh, the, we use these values uh, to um, explore how uh, in that there was locker tokens amount is changing during this period of time. We can set it manually. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. The next, pre the next presentation is uh, modeling of the non-lining impact of climatic factor on wheat yield using machine learning technique. Presenter, Maxim Pavrilyuk. Okay. So, welcome to all conference participants. Uh, the topic of my presentation is modeling of the nonlinear impact of climatic factor uh, on wheat yield uh, using machine learning techniques. 
Uh, grain production was of the most important branches of the economy of Ukraine, ensuring the food needs of the population and a stable inflow of currency. The average grain production in Ukraine for the years 2019-2021 reached uh, 75 million tons. However, the gross grain harvest and uh, the grain yield in Ukraine are subject to significant fluctuations, most often explained uh, by the influence of uh, variable climatic factors. Yield forecasting is the basis uh, for making business decisions in grain production. Uh, forecasting the grain yield uh, is a complex task due to the random nature of influencing factors. Uh, to build yield forecasting model, we used machine learning techniques. Uh, the period of observation uh, of the agroclimatic features of Ukraine region spans only a few decades. Uh, talking into account uh, the complex changes in economics mechanism uh, that have occurred in Ukraine agriculture over the past 30 years, we understand that statistical studies can only be uh, conducted using data from 2000 to 2021. During this time, a new type of uh, large grain farms or holdings has emerged, which have become uh, the main grain producers in Ukraine. Uh, on the other hand, the military actions that began uh, in Ukraine in 2021 do not uh, all allow us uh, to include data from this uh, year and later into the analysis due to significant losses of the material base of grain production and ongoing military threats. In this study, we use statistical climatic data and with yield from uh, uh, 2000 to 2021 from the region of Ukraine. Uh, the similar nature of climatic characteristic of neighboring region allow uh, them to be grouped into agroclimatic zone. A large volume uh, of uh, data from agroclimatic zone make it possible to use machine learning techniques from modeling. Uh, this slide show correlation metrics from the transit yield uh, time series. Analysis of the correlation matrix constructed from the transit yield uh, time series allows uh, us to identify three agroclimatic zones in Ukraine. Uh, the nature of the influence of climatic factor on wheat yield uh, fluctuation will be different to it uh, on this zone. Uh, this slide uh, shows uh, wheat yield uh, dynamic in Kherson region. To modeling uh, of uh, yield dynamics, a linear trend we used, trend T. Uh, the trended yield, uh, EPST, is determined by the ratio. Here, uh, YT with yield and uh, T its time. The trended yield uh, EPST is a uh, function of climatic factors. Uh, in this slide uh, shows climatic factor inflation fluctuation in wheat yield. We investigate the impact of the following climatic factor on wheat yield. T1, the mean temperature during the 10 days period of from April 1st to April 10th in decreased Celsius. T2, the mean uh, uh, temperature during the 10 days period from April 1st to April 10th in uh, 11th to April 12th, and so on. Uh, R10, uh, April precipitation in millimeters. R20, May precipitation in millimeters. R30 uh, is June uh, precipitation in millimeters. EPS, it's the trend uh, with yield uh, centenaires per hectare. Uh, in this slide, uh, you can see the multiply linear regression model in the steppe region. Uh, the steppe zone uh, includes Kherson, Mykolaiv, Odessa, Dnipropetrovsk, Zaporizhia, and Kirovrat regions. To build and implement the model, we used the Python program in environmental. Uh, let's build a multiply reg regression model of the steppe zone. In general, the model looks like this, EPS. Uh, the model is uh, generally adequate. Uh, the probability of a statistical p-value is less than 0 0.05. Uh, 
However, some factors is, is, are significant. Uh, removing these uh, factors will head uh, to a slight uh, decrease uh, in R square, uh, but the statistical significance of the model with, will increase. The R square value uh, for the full model is uh, 0 0.51. For the reduced model, the R square value is 0 0.5. Uh, while R square decreased uh, slightly, the model statistical significance improved are removing insignificant factor. Uh, the impact of climatic factor on plant vegetation is significantly nonlinear. Uh, this is uh, due to the experience uh, of an optimal ecological uh, niche for a given species. Uh, the multiplier nonlinear regression model, uh, the step region, uh, you can see a general, uh, the model looks like this. Uh, quadratic factor allow uh, capturing uh, increased sensitivity from uh, crop yield to climatic factor and specific stage of vegetation. Uh, the product of two consecutive climatic factors reflect the community effects uh, of the factor which is stronger than uh, the combined effects of the factor. After removing insignificant factors, the model looks like this, uh, table 8. Uh, this model includes four linear, seven quadratic, and three interaction between consecutive factors, uh, such as product of consecutive factors. Uh, taking into account nonlinear factor improved the quality of regression model. The R square value increased from 0 0.5 uh, to 0 0.73. The p value also increased. I find it difficult uh, to read these numbers. Uh, this slide uh, you can see multiplier linear regression model uh, for the step uh, zone. Uh, let's build a multiplier linear regression model for the forest step zone. After removing the in a significant factor, the model takes the following from uh, table six. Uh, the multiplier linear regression model for the western zone. After removing uh, the insignificant factor, the model taken uh, takes uh, F the following form, table 7. The multiplier nonlinear regression uh, for the forest step zone and western zone. Uh, as we can see, taking into account nonlinear factor significantly improved the quality of the regression model. Uh, the nonlinear regression model for the step zone includes four linear factors, seven quadratic factors, and three product of uh, consecutive factors. The nonlinear regression model for the step for a step zone includes three linear factors, eight uh, quadratic factors, and two product of consecutive factors. And uh, the nonlinear regression model of the Western zone include five linear factors, three quadratic factors, and eight product of consecutive factors. Uh, for the step zone, it is uh, more important to uh, consider uh, the short-term impact of variable climatic factors. Uh, for the Western zone, long-term uh, climatic influence uh, are more significant. Uh, that you can see in table 12. Uh, this slide shows uh, graphical contemporary linear on, and non-linear regression model for the from one uh, of the set uh, of test data. The superior quality of uh, the non-linear model is visually apparent. And main results. Based on wheat uh, yield dynamic in Ukraine, three agroecological zones can be identified. Uh, the wheat yield in the region of Ukraine showed uh, an increasing trend. Uh, however, this trend is accompanied by significant fluctuation, mainly due 
to the influence of climatic factors. The multiplier regression linear uh, model can explain the trended yield fluctuations with the reliability of uh, 25% to 50%. The multiplier nonlinear regression model can explain the trended yield fluctuations with the reliability of 70, uh, 57% to 73%. We have shown the importance of considering the nonlinear impact of climatic factor on the fluctuation toward wind yield. The model we have built allow forecasting uh, with yield with a forecast horizon of three months. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Question, please. Uh, but to me, it looked like you used uh, categorical variables, right? In the yes. beginning. Also for the precipitation, for the millimeters, uh, right? Yes, the months, uh, millimeters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but wouldn't it be, um, I mean, if you have, for example, five millimeters and six millimeters, you have a different category. And wouldn't it be maybe better to use it as a linear variable? So it's worded. So six is higher than five, and you have categories where six is something different than five. It's but uh, you lose a little bit of information. What? It's uh, always important. Okay, so you also consider for that, o also in the categorical mm -hmm. variable. Yes. Okay. So did you also? Um do a data splitting approach where you had uh, the first part as training data and the rest as test data so that you can uh, realistically estimate the performance of the model. You looked at the R squared, the adjusted R squared, but that doesn't always um, take the overfitting into account. So if you, I mean, you, uh, you, the model can fit the data very well, but still not may not be performed that good on on new data, so did you maybe also did a splitting of the data in the training and test data? Yes, train and the test the data. Train it seventy uh, percent. Uh, train it. Uh, okay, so so you uh, oversaw that. I think. Mm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Just to uh, to <laughs> to make more clear, and what was the quality of your model on this? that data set, you, you say you have training data set and validation, and what was the quality? Uh, data temperature yeah. and precipitation. Uh, uh, quality in numbers. Yeah. You're talking about uh, precision for three months and what is the results? Uh, if you say for months, it is decadal. Uh, we uh, short months on three in decadal uh, after 10 days. No, I am talking about quality of the model that you providing. Any question? Okay, uh, any question? Oh. I have okay. a question. Uh, did you take into account the periodic character of the um, of climat climatic parameters? Climatic data? Okay, Ma one, one year, and uh, this is nat action. natural period. Yes. Vegetation period is uh, May, June, and April. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you.
The next presentation is uh, usage of uh, the message broker technology in the adaptive software systems. Presenter Ilya Lutsk. Okay, uh, good afternoon. My name is Ilya Lutsik. I am a PhD student in the National University of the Polytechnic National University. And the topic uh, that I want to present is the usage of message broker technology in the adaptive software systems. One second. Yeah, so uh, we need to start from the relevance of work. So uh, as we know, the competitiveness in the modern software is very high. And the more and more approachable is the way to create adaptable and flexible software. Uh, but this flexibility and this uh, dynamic functionality of the software is al always uh, connected to software architecture, its modularity, and the ability to dynamically configure uh, software components. Uh, it's a key part to the communication between the processes is a message brokers, which allows not only just transfer the messages between the different software or the services, but also will allow us to have asynchronous com communications and will help us to build up some loosely coupled uh, services, which will allow us to grow the uh, software more naturally and more dynamically as it should be without the, some constraints to some interface or some uh, structure of uh, some component. It should be noted that the use of specified technology for the adaptive software system will ensure the full separation of the configuration uh, determination process as well as the adaptation process of the graphical and uh, functional components. So uh, the purpose of this study is to present and design a method of dynamic software adaptation based on the use of message broker technology. It will uh, improve and further develop uh, technology of implementing multimodal software system, uh, which will allow to dynamically form and adapt software components to the user's needs, but based on the message brokers. So at the beginning, we need to say more about uh, message broker technology, specifically the protocol, uh, uh, Advanced Messaging Query Protocol, AMPQP. Uh, this protocol and the mechanism allow us not only communicate between services loosely, but also will allow us to have a better connection between the processes. And it will allow us to have the better uh, dynamic uh, correlation between some messages. Uh, so uh, by semantics, uh, message worker allows us to adjust the data to the needs of each service or user based on the message queues, data flow distribution, and subscription. Uh, all these three services build up, build up on the three main component. Uh, the first one is exchange. It's the, the main and initial part of the broker, uh, which kind of uh, manages as a router that will allow us to route our specific message from one service to another and will allow us to help uh, to distribute the message just to correct services. Uh, the queue is a temporary stores, uh, storage of data. So basically, uh, the queue is our data storage that will transfer the messages from exchange to exchange and from the service to the service. And it's these two parts is uh, combined by the term bindings, which is uh, basically a rules for distributing a messages from the exchange to the component or the queue. Or if uh, we merge the exchange and queue together, it will help us to uh, distribute message from one service to another. Uh, we need to say that there is a couple of, uh, of uh, message queue types and uh, exchange types. Uh, there is generally three main ones. We have the fourth one that it's modified version of the topic exchange. But if we uh, uh, introduce each, uh, we need to introduce each one uh, by a sequence. So the first one is the uh, 
most generic and most useful for the direct communication. It's a di direct exchange. Uh, from the, uh, we see at the top uh, the direct exchange. It's combined by the binding key, and the binding key it's very uh, very uh, tightly coupled uh, because we have the words that already always connect connect one exchange to one queue or one exchange to 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 two queues based on the different uh, binding keys. Uh, the next one is um, a topic exchange. It delivers a message to one or different queues based on the uh, pattern matching of the binding key. As we see from the slide, there is two binding keys. The first one uses uh, asterisk in it, and the, uh, the another is using hash. The difference is we need, we can pattern match to allow us, for example, in the first case, have adaptation vers version one and point one, which will allow us to use only one word, and the, another one will allow us to have a um, one or multiple words in the binded key. And the third one is a um, fanout uh, exchange, which is uh, basically a broadcast call to the multiple services, to multiple queues and exchanges that will allow us to distribute the same message to uh, all the queues with uh, ignoring the uh, defined uh, binded key. And the last one, uh, the most useful in the adaptation process is a dead letter exchange. It's, it's an improved version of the topic exchange, will allow us to bind the specific queue to the specific um, specific exchange, sorry, for, to specific queue based on the pattern matching of the binding key, but it has some uh, capabilities that will allow us to um, store the information more securely. So uh, in the adaptation process, the Exceptional situations may occur very rapidly or uh, very unexpectedly. Uh, so we need the way to somehow store the information more or less in the SKU itself. And because in the main three uh, exchanges we have the, the message is lost, uh, we need to use the dead letter exchange. From the schema, we can see that this type of exchange is kind of uh, contains of two parts. The first one is the first uh, configuration queue. So the it's the main one that will help us to contribute uh, and to deliver message from service to service. And then we have the section in the right, which contains retry exchange, retry queue, and the letter exchange. So it uh, works uh, in, in the way that if we have the message that is um, processing and we have some exceptional situation, we can redirect it to the exchange, re retry exchange. It will, see, it will uh, then send the message to retry queue, which will store the information in the retry queue. And based on the parameters and headers, we, we can delete this message based on the time or based on the number of tries. Then after the time is, uh, is uh, up, we, can, uh, we will store it, uh, we will send it to the dead letter exchange, which will redirect it back to the main configuration queue. Uh, it will allow us to ha have the possibility to restore some processing powers when the one or two services uh, have lost connection to the, the main configuration service. So basic, uh, based on the uh, this data, data exchange and the master broker, we propose the, this kind of uh, architecture, which consists of three layers. Uh, the first one, the application service is connecting to the data synchronization layer and data server by, by two ways. The first one is a knowledge-based interface, uh, which will allow us to swap uh, the data server based if we need the other implementation. And it's also not uh, hurting us to use a RabbitMQ service, which will specifically direct the messages between application service and the data server based on the routing key and the um, uh, routing service. Uh, this allow us to have um, this, this dynamic uh, determination of software configuration. Uh, apart from the standard um, 
authorization process, we present here a um, additional method to secure the uh, user data. So if, um, for example, user transfers its data from one, uh, from one application to another, uh, like from mobile to, uh, to, uh, to another uh, desktop, we can store the, this uh, uh, data and configuration in the cache. It doesn't matter, it's distributed in memory cache or some system like Redis and then restore it uh, on the different device. So this part is allowing us to, uh, this part allowing us to have the more uh, power and more secure way to store the information. Uh, as uh, we said earlier, the configuration process is dynamic and can uh, rely on retries based on the uh, errors and based on the uh, configuration process. So here in the scheme, we also have the, uh, conditional requirements for the message broker that if, for example, number of retries is more than uh, one and uh, the data not sync, we can try another configuration process if some error occurred earlier. If not, we can start it in the log lo using login system or dynamically uh, send the report to the, um, the main application. So uh, this is helping us in the future research because uh, the implementation of uh, of uh, dynamic configuration helping uh, us with uh, ontological uh, processing of ontological rules that used in determination of uh, uh, software configuration and uh, message broker was used to test how effective it is to distribute uh, messages between multiple services and not only to help us to um, to reduce the processing time but also uh, it's helping us to reduce the strain on the different services so because we can uh, basically scale the software uh, and not just be uh, coupled to the some implementation we can then further improve the uh, the speed of the adaptability and the strain on the cpu usage and the memory usage as well uh, so the next the prospect for the future research is to combine the scalability techniques uh, with the message broker that will allow us to not only scale the software, but the, uh, scale our model as a software uh, system, which will also uh, improve the adaptation time and techniques based on the ontological rules and the message broker. So as a conclusion, we can say that the message exchange model for adaptive system was designed to allow us to uh, uh, have a real-time communication and adaptation uh, for the adaptive software. This allows us to not only have a communication between services, but also uh, have the secure way to store and, uh, and manage the different uh, data between the multiple services. And based on the algorithm that was proposed, we can say that it will allow us not only dynamically modify the components on the adaptive software, but also uh, reduce the strain and stress on the uh, server components that will also function as a uh, caching service for the storing future configurations. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, you spent six slides, uh, slides about message brokers, and it's quite popular technology. And only three slides about what you're doing in your work. And uh, after it, you provide some uh, diagram with some ontologies, rules, and yeah. something else, but you doesn't matter what uh, what uh, this about. And uh, you're saying that ActiveMQ is technology that will help you doing something, but I can't understand what. Okay. And maybe if we are talking about technologies, you can uh, provide some analysis of using some remote procedure calls, such as JRPC, 
and it can uh, solve such problems in the in uh, not <laughs> uh, maybe better way. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I understand. So to to answer this, I we analyze in different. Yeah, so uh, I will explain. So we we try to use the different techniques, and we I try to analyze to, uh, different techniques that we allow us to have the communication between services and to have the technologies that, uh, like you said, JRPC. But in the my, uh, in the development in the current implementation, we stopped on the message brokers because it helped us to redistribute the messages between the service more more dynamically uh we uh i worked with a service that um, transfer multiple and tens of thousand uh, files through the between the multiple services and the message brokers was used as the main technology because it allow us to have this flexibility to store the data to have this retry mechanism and it's uh, more or less useful. Yes, we can use the difference. I'm not saying it's the best one, but for the adaptation pr purposes, it's for from what we analyzed, it's better and it's allow us to have some flexibility in it to not real uh, to not rely on some interface and and replace it dynamically. message brokers, you will have another problems with fault tolerance of your system, because if uh, ActiveMQ is not working in the time that you are trying to send message, you should provide something like Saga and so on. If you are using something like uh, ActiveMQ, you will have KHDB inside it, and you will have problems with KHDB. Last week, we have broken KHDB, and after it, ActiveMQ stopped working. If you, you will use Kafka, you will, uh, you will have a lot of brokers and a lot of costs. Yeah, uh, so basically in our... All, uh, what I, I mean, all these technologies have yes, plus yeah. and minuses. Yes, yeah. Yeah, so we try to to be more low level, so it's not using Kafka or ActiveMQ. We using RabbitMQ, which yes, it has some uh, some flaws, but from what we have now and working at least one year, it's never was unreliable. And for for not very many calls, it will help still to reduce distribute messages. Any question? Uh, I used uh, RabbitMQ on my project and uh, um, we had this problem uh, related to um, missing messages and uh, stacked queues. So could you please elaborate a little about use cases of your concrete architecture? Because in my experience, as I understand, each project may implement something what is suitable for them but if you created something universal, uh, may you please little explain or <laughs> add some yeah. details about your um, use yeah. cases? Yeah, okay. Uh, so uh, the main use case we have, it's uh, when we transferring a lot of files that uh, it's transferring and doing calculation uh, between them. Many relies on the, uh, the foreign services. But uh, the architecture was simple. We didn't create the multiple and um, different queues. We have this kind of system like, like we have on the slide, which we have one queue for the um, for the the main conf uh, confirmation between different services. So we store the, the message, we are receiving, it, and we doing we will do the manual acknowledgement, not have this data broken down. Uh, and then if some, some retry is, uh, if we have some error, we send uh, the message to the retry exchange. Uh, we use a multiple of, uh, we use one specific header, which uh, um, time to live in the uh, retry, uh, retry queue. And uh, we have created additional uh, header, which can be custom made in the, uh, in the RabbitMQ. 
and we we uh, assign the number of retries to have ability to to re not flood the system uh, more further. So uh, the how how it works? We send the the message to retry exchange. It sits for for, for what we configured was uh, five minutes in it. And it will start uh, redistrib redistributing into the, uh, the the next service. If if we have the ability to, if the service is restored, we can clear the queue quite quite well. So we can uh, start uh, detecting the messages from the uh, from the retry queue. But if the service is still unavailable. Uh, that's trying to manage the file we send into the configuration queue, which will try again the configuration process, and will, based on the result, either will uh, store the information and log the data because if the retry extra retry is uh, is expired, or it will just loop back to a retry exchange in the in the projects that we used it, it's never went badly uh, and the and the services is also was available because we have a combination of the scaling of horizontal uh, scaling and uh, this message system. So yes, yeah, so that's basic process we used. Thank you. Thank you. We worked quite efficient. <laughs> and uh, our award is the long coffee break. <laughs> coffee break. So, so the next uh, session uh, is here at uh, uh, half past three. <laughs>